Well, what a privilege it is to be sharing God's word with you. And I was reflecting on um, how we evaluate the importance of different things over the last week. And um, you know that we are in a, a series of um, looking at the book of Philippians. And uh, we had a little bit of back and forth of this title um, about audacious. It turns out uh, I quite... It's grown on me slowly over the weeks. And so I'm going to start off this morning and say what I think is a pretty audacious statement. And that is what we're going to be talking about and looking at this morning is perhaps, definitely, the most important thing in our lives. It is the framing thought that if we get this right, it changes Everything. It changes how we live today, tomorrow, and for eternity. So this is something that is important to uh, take a listen to. But we here in the book of Philippians, Paul has been making some pretty bold claims throughout it. And he starts off with the beginning of Philippians chapter 2 saying things pretty plainly. Now, you know, sometimes at Bible college they teach you that you really need to look deeply at a text to understand what it says. I think the book of Philippians and the second chapter, at least how it starts, is maybe the one time where you don't have to look so deeply and see what it says. You just need to read it and take it for what is written. Um, and... Again, if we, if we frame our thinking that this changes everything, we have a message. So let me pray for us as we dive in, and then we'll get going. Father God, you are so good, and we thank you that we can carve out this time from our week and focus on the most important thing. Lord, we know that we come to this place with our minds filled with different stresses and anxieties and uh, distractions. Lord, would you just for this moment clear those thoughts so that we would be able to focus on Jesus, that we would be able to focus on the beauty and power and humility and example that we have in Jesus. And so as we spend this time together, be at work within our hearts, within our minds, um, by the work of your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. find different Bible translations to be really helpful to kind of get to grips with what is being said. And so just these four, first four verses, I want to share with you from the message translation, and then we'll switch to a different one when we get into the crux. But this is what Paul says as he starts Philippians chapter 2, a little bit of a paraphrase. If you've got anything out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Do this. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. This is the context that precedes the text that we're going to be looking at. He says, if any of this Christian business actually means anything to you, you're going to do something. Okay? Something's coming in verse 5. But I think that's a really helpful way to frame our thinking, that we each have something that colors our perspective and outlook on the world. But we might have just come to church for the first time this morning. We might have been uh, believers for a really long time. But he says, if anything, if you're at any progress level, any degree of spiritual maturity, if you have any value in what you found about belief in Jesus, then listen to this one thing. And he says this one thing in verse 5. Let's take a look at it. He says, sorry, my notes are more deceptive than helpful. 
Okay? He says this. He says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Okay? So this is like a little bit of a key verse here, and then from the next verses, so he says, if this means anything to you, if being a Christian means anything, then have the attitude of Christ Jesus, and then in the next verses, he's going to show us what Jesus did, and that's what we're really focusing on, but he says, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, or other translations say, have a mind among yourselves, or you must have the same attitude that Jesus has. Or think of yourselves the way that Jesus thought of himself. Have a Christ-like mindset, okay? That's what this is thinking. So this is something that we are deciding. It's an intentional decision. It's something that you need to say yes or no to, okay? Have this attitude. Make up your mind. Second point. He also speaks about, if you go to, yeah, there we go. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. Have this mind amongst yourselves. You, plural, have this attitude yourselves. Okay, so he speaks about this plural nature of this mindset. So, in some sense, there's a twofold decision that we're making here. I would like to have the same mindset as that of Christ Jesus. And then somehow, together, corporately, we, as a church, as a body of believers, are saying we would like to do this. I think that's really helpful when it's going to come to the application, because being a Christian is not a lone ranger calling, okay? We need each other. We were made for community. We belong in this place because we, together, are making a common decision to say, yes, I want to have the mind of Christ Jesus. I want to have the attitude that Jesus had because that is the example to follow. Actually, in Philippians, Paul says and gives us a couple of good examples of who to follow. Elsewhere in his writings, he makes the really bold claim. He says, hey, if you want to follow Jesus, then like, follow me because I am seeking to reflect Jesus in my lifestyle. Later in the book of Philippians, we'll unpack in the series, we get these examples of believers who he calls out, Timothy and Epaphroditus. He says, hey, these are good examples for you to follow, but we all are in this somehow together. We are united in Christ, and now we together must walk after him. Okay? So we together are working towards looking like Christ Jesus. We may choose different role models to follow, but the ultimate example, so Paul isn't saying, hey, follow me, because I've got some great ideas that build onto everything that someone else has taught. He's saying, I'm seeking to reflect what it looks like to live after Jesus. You should live according to that as well. Let's do this together. It's sort of like an invitation, but Jesus is the example. Jesus is the perfect example, and now we're getting into our text. Okay, so this, let me just, before you change the slide, this little text is one which has uh, gripped the imaginations of people for really long. Why? Well, because it's such a plain recollection of Pure doctrine, explaining who Jesus is, what he did, and why that matters for us. It actually is believed to be an early hymn. Now, I don't know how many of you remember hymn books or have been in churches with hymn books. Okay, less than 20%, okay? At least less than 20% of the people that are engaging, yeah. Less than 20%, but you know that hymn books like carry songs that have been like agreed upon, people have like accepted them, we'll pick out ones like Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art or I don't know what your favorite hymn is, but those are hymns that, I mean, even believers who come from different traditions or different denominations or different backgrounds, for hundreds of years have pretty much consistently sung What we have here in Philippians chapter 2 from verse 6 through 11 
is almost like a primitive hymn of the early church. They don't know which tune it was according to. They don't know if they played it on a, they probably didn't play it on a fancy little keyboard like that, but um, they would have believed these things and doctrine, which is sung, really sort of ingrains itself in us. I mean, I think a lot of the way in which we view God and Jesus and the world is actually shaped partially by how the preacher takes the text and speaks through things. But, I mean, the worship leaders have a pretty key role in the songs that they choose because, I mean, I remember far more worship songs than I do Bible passages, right? Same for you? Cool. Okay? So these would be things that people have memorized. It's something that they get to internalize and dig through. But let us take a look at this passage. Now, my mom always says, she'll tell me she went to church, and she'll say, Byron, her pastor, preached such a great sermon. But, you know, it just, I don't understand why he doesn't go through verse by verse like you used to go through verse by verse. So I've grown in my preaching, and I don't usually go through verse by verse, but in this passage, we've got a perfect opportunity to go verse by verse and find a little bit of a shape that I'll show you of this text. So here we go. So this is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Who being in very... So he says, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus... This is what it is. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He's just spoken about like, hey, stop competing and deciding amongst yourselves, like reflect Jesus. Jesus didn't compete. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. For this reason, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay? Jesus enjoyed this position from the beginning. John's gospel starts with the words, In the beginning there was God, and the word was, with God, and the Word was God. And he's speaking about Jesus being the Word. So Jesus starts from the very beginning, but he lays it aside. Paul says to us, who existing in the form of God became person. There was never a time that Jesus didn't exist. We're told elsewhere through the New Testament about Jesus being the Alpha and the Omega, okay? Like this, from the beginning of the alphabet to the end of the alphabet, from the beginning of time to the end of time, from the first word that was spoken to the last word that will be spoken, there was God, and with God was Jesus, okay? Together. Here we also have something about the divinity of God. If we can just flick to the next one. Uh, Okay. Okay. So we have this notion that Jesus is himself divine. There was never a time that Jesus didn't exist. And not only did he exist, he existed as God. We get the little word here about There's a Greek word that's used that says form. So Jesus was the form of God. But when this word is used, it's not like he just 
shape-shifted and adopted that look for a minute, and then he shape-shifted into being a man, and then he shape-shifted into being something else. The word form actually means his inherent essence, his absolute being was God. So now these are complex things to wrap our heads up, but if anything, this should trigger amazement. Though he was in the form of God, though he was God, he didn't count equality with God as a thing to be, go- to be grasped. And in the same way, he took the form of a servant. He actually became a person. He was fully human and fully divine. Now, that's something is a massive thought to wrap your head around. It's a thought that I actually can't fully explain. And if I could fully explain it, it actually wouldn't be such an incredible thought. Jesus, fully God, fully man, but one person. Okay? Try to explain it. You're probably going to spew a little bit of heresy. The church has gone through periods of time where people have tried to articulate this and wrap their head around it and complicate it with an unhelpful metaphor of like, I mean, in Bible school we learn about Jesus being or the Trinity being like water and ice and steam and like three different phases and an egg which has a shell and a yolk and a white. And all of those are absolutely useless because if you try and explain it, you start missing it. Okay? There were six people through church history in the early couple of hundreds of years who tried to articulate this and each of them got something wrong. So if you really want to deep dive this on your way home, you can hear about Ebionism and Arianism and Nestorianism and Apollinarianism and Eutychianism and Docetism. And it's like all these different guys said, I can explain this. Like, I've understood. I've wrapped my head around it. And you, like, dissect their argument, and they're like, hmm. no. But there was one cool guy. His name was Athanasius. And at the Council of Nicaea, Early church council, 325 AD, he says, Jesus, fully God, fully man, united in one person. And out of that council, we got a creed, the Apostles' Creed, which, or the Nicene Creed, which actually like, started forming the basis of the Christian creeds that would come through church history. This is what it says. It says, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Isn't that incredible? We might not be able to understand it, but isn't that fantastic that we can't? that we've got a God who goes beyond our human comprehension and we're able to put into a box? I think it's amazing. But here's the truth. So for hundreds of years, the church and true Christians have believed this fact, that Jesus is fully God, fully human, united in one person. And we haven't really had major debates about this since the last of the church councils in like the 500s and 600s. But this is true for us, and this is what you need to take from it. In every single generation, there's needed to be an audacious defense, audacious contention for the biblical view of the person and work of Jesus Christ. You know, you go walk around, there's these guys that I follow on Instagram, young Gen Z movement, they're super cool. And they'll go to like Monte Casino and they'll walk around with their little microphones and they'll walk up to uh, young people and say like, who was Jesus? And, you know, the people are like trying to grapple with who Jesus is and some say, well, he was a really great example or he was a really good teacher, or he was a really good man, or he was a prophet. All those things, I mean, really, this is the thought we need to wrap our head around. Absolute truth in a world that doesn't love absolutes. 
Jesus was fully God. Jesus was fully man, united in one person. So how's this? Jesus, as incredible as he is, Paul continues. He says, he did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. He didn't consider being God as something to grounds on which to claim that he should get something. Instead, he chose to give. Now, we live in a culture that loves getting. Even I love getting, you know? And when I have a little bit of an upper hand, I want to maximize it for my strategic advantage and make sure that I don't miss the opportunity that I have to further my own interests. That's called human nature. Not Jesus. Jesus didn't consider being God as something to be held onto or grasped because he knew that he was the only solution to the problem of our sin. Aren't we so much in the habit of wanting to snatch rather than offer something out? We are so different to Jesus. Jesus lived open-handedly, showing us what generosity and service look like. Aren't we just so good at holding on to everything that we have, making sure that all the rights and owings that we have are counting in our favor? What if we apply Jesus' mindset to the different situations that we encounter, the different relationships that we have? Imagine relationships where we sought to give more than we sought to receive. Jesus shows us the way to live. Let's take a quick look at the differences between Adam, who's an example of man, and us. Adam was made in God's image. Jesus was and is the very essence of God. Adam wanted to be like God, but Jesus was willing to take on the likeness of man. Adam was all about exalting himself, and Jesus emptied himself. Adam was discontent at being God's servant, But Jesus was ready and willing to become a slave. Adam arrogantly rejected God's word in sinful disobedience. But Jesus humbly submitted to God's word in perfect obedience. Adam succumbed to temptation, but Jesus overcame temptation and in doing so, crushed the tempter. Adam brought curse on the world Jesus took the curse for the world. Adam was condemned and disgraced, and Jesus was exalted by his Father. Now, of all the perfect models that we can think of in this world, how can we more start looking like Jesus? How can we go from being graspers to givers? How can we imitate Jesus in adopting this willingness to go down when in this world we are constantly tempted to further ourselves and climb the ladder? We need the second Adam. Not only do we need to watch Jesus' example, we need Jesus himself for us through his perfect life And his atoning death, he gives our race forgiveness, new life, and empowers us to live like him. So we're going to see a little bit of a downward journey that Jesus goes on to on the next slide. So first off, he renounces, okay? He's like, he doesn't consider being equal with God as something to be held on to, so he lets go. Then... He goes one step further. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature 
of a servant being made in human likeness. We sang that a little bit earlier, right? From exalted in glory to a cradle in the dirt. What a beautiful picture of that vast difference between what Jesus did in humbling himself. Now, this is really the uh, phrase that um, people often get stuck on in this passage. Uh, Other translations say, he emptied himself, and so theologians for centuries have argued what this word emptying means, but I found this as a helpful one to hold on to. Christ refused to hold on to his divine rights and prerogatives. He veiled his deity, but he didn't void his deity. Okay, so Jesus, still God, comes in the form of man. Tricky thought for us to wrap our heads around. But here's a little illustration that has helped me understand it from a guy named Brian Chappell. He tells a story of an African missionary um, who is the chief, the strongest man in the village. As being a chief, he also wears a really large ceremonial headdress um, thingy and some ceremonial robes. One day, a man was carrying um, water out of the shaft of a deep well, and he fell and broke his leg. He lay at the bottom of the well, helpless, unable to get up. To get down to the bottom, someone would have to climb into this well and go down its narrow shaft using alternating steps that go all the way down and then somehow climb all the way back up. Because no one could carry the helpless man up, the chief was summoned. When he saw the plight of the man, he laid aside his headdress and his robe, and he climbed all the way to the bottom, put the injured man on himself, and brought him to safety. He did what no other man could. And that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus came to rescue us, But how do you think the chief got into the well? Wearing his robe and his crown? Probably not. Had to lay that aside, put that down, go down, and come back up. Was at the bottom of the well him just wearing whatever he was wearing without the crown and the robe? Was he still the chief? Of course, he was the chief. Did Jesus stop being God when he came to rescue us? Of course not. But instead, he became man to do what he needed to do. He needed to fulfill his destiny, and only by becoming a person could he do that. So he became a person. We move one step further. He humbled himself to such a point that he died. He died not just a simple, clean, one-shot death. He died a brutal, disturbing death, even death on a cross. doesn't hold on to being God, but is willing to let that aside, comes down as a man, humbles himself, born in human likeness, so that he can do what God has destined him to do, die, death on a cross. And for what purpose? To restore relationship between us and God. But following the biblical principle of whoever humbles themselves will be exalted, so too does this carry on. Therefore, 
God exalted him to the highest place. And not only did he exalt him to the highest place, but he gave him the name above every other name. At the time of Jesus, there were lots of names that had importance. And one of those names was Caesar, whoever was the Roman ruler at the time. But Jesus gets a better name than even Caesar. Jesus gets the name above every other name because as Jesus is obedient to God's plan, God's plan continues to be fulfilled. And then not only does Jesus get a great name, one that is worthy above every other name, but he gets a name that is adored forever. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The earliest Christian confession is probably that phrase, Jesus Christ is Lord, but because to say Jesus Christ is Lord means that you're saying something else saying that Caesar is not, saying I'm following Jesus for each of us here today, means that we're saying we're not following ourselves. We're not doing what we want to do. We're not living according to our own desires and plans. We are following after Jesus. The reality is, and this is why I say this is the most important thing, is because the Bible tells us that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Some will say Jesus Christ is Lord with great joy and humility. And I hope that is true for all of us here this morning. The harsh truth is that others will confess him as Lord with deep despair and anguish. Pontius Pilate, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, they'll confess him as Lord as well one day, but under very different circumstances. We confess Jesus as Lord now, and we also look forward to the day when everyone will acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. We're not just like living in a moment of history where we're running on a treadmill, like waiting for something to happen. Every day, we are one day closer to every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you don't acknowledge and confess that Jesus is Lord in this life, it will be too late after death. What an audacious claim to make. What an audacious claim to make for the early church, saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. But what an audacious claim for you to make, saying Jesus is Lord and, I don't know what that looks like for you, but you're going to say Jesus is Lord and the rest of my life is going to be prioritized around that. Every other framing thought that I have changes when Jesus Christ is Lord. I think often what we get wrong in church is that we want to fix people's behavior before we fix their belief. Okay, That never really leads to great outcomes. But if we have right belief to start with, our behavior, our lives naturally change. And so what What change does that mean for us? Get there in a second. Last slide. What's the point of all this? It's not just to, like, live a little bit of a better life or escape the fire of hell. No. It's to the glory of God the Father. The ultimate purpose for which everything was created. The ultimate purpose... For which, in the beginning of Genesis, we hear that God speaks 
And what was the point of God speaking and creating and making his glory? God seeks glory for his name. That is the purpose for which you and I are created. And now we have a pattern to follow. Have the mindset and attitude of Jesus. Let go of yourself. Humbly submit and lead others to the glory of his name. So if you've stopped listening, come back for a second. Next slide. If you go home with nothing else, if you're like, I don't know why I went to church this morning, this guy just like went on a rant about uh, Arianism and I don't know what else. Uh, just, just for a minute, let's Let's wrap this up. Let's look to Jesus so that we can start looking like Jesus. What a different world. What a different country. What a different Pretoria we would have if we adopted the mindset of Christ Jesus. What a different reality each of us would be facing in our homes, in marriages, in relationships, in work situations, in financial planning. If we chose to look to Jesus and start living like him. Start living lives that look like it. And so how can we do that? Just got three quick points. First of all, believe it. I don't know if you're here this morning, and if you can confidently say, Jesus Christ is Lord. If you can say that, amen. Believe that and get to know him. And that's not like a once-off statement. That's like a day-by-day. Day. I mean, for me, most days it's like an hour-by-hour hour statement. Because that frames the way in which I think. If you want to get to know the Jesus that you're saying he is Lord... Go read the Gospels. You've got beautiful accounts of what the life of Jesus looked like. Get to know him. Don't say yes to a Lord that you're unfamiliar with. Just like you wouldn't vote for a political party that you don't know what they're all about. We can't follow after someone that we don't know. Believe it. Say it to yourself. Jesus is fully God, fully human, united in one person. That will settle a lot of things in your mind. Grapple with it. If you've got questions, ask them. Reflect on it. Go on a journey of discovery. We're not afraid of questions. Trying to wrap your head around it? Come talk. Go to your life group. Get involved. Hit up the guest area afterwards. Come chat. Get to know Jesus. What a gift we have in Philippians chapter 2. This morning in a meeting that happened before the service, we heard that the children's ministry, so if you've got kids in children's ministry this morning, they having their moolah market, okay? They like earn points or pseudo currency in exchange for um, memorizing scripture verses. How many scripture verses do you know? I mean, I'm asking this on myself. But here you've got a passage that's actually memorable. Go after it. Start dwelling on these things. Dwell on it regularly. And if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, come to a point of working towards that. God will meet you where you are at. There are answers to the questions that you have. Go find them. Don't wait until it's too late. Next up, speak it. Say it. Say it in your mind. Say it in your heart. Sing it. Shout it out. Jesus Christ is Lord. Proclaim it with your mouth. Say it to your children. Say it to your family and your friends. Elsewhere in Paul's writings, he says, we don't grieve how other people believe. We've got a reason for the hope that we have. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the answer to the reason. Say it with not people just here in this church this morning. Say it not only with people in churches across South Africa or Africa. Say it with people around the world today, Sunday. Millions upon millions of people are meeting in church buildings, some as publicly as us, others in secret at fear of being killed, are saying this truth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it. Then last of all, live it. This changes the way in which we live. This changes your life. It changes your time, your money, your priority, your relationships, your behavior. It changes everything. And this is the attitude that we should pursue. Remember Paul's words to us? He says, have the mindset of Christ Jesus. No one gives us a better model than Jesus. Tell the world about the message of this passage. Our mission is to tell the world that Jesus is Lord, and if they will confess and believe him as such, they will be saved. Let us adore him. Let us adopt attitudes of worship. Let our minds be on him. Let our attitudes be like his. Let our actions reflect him. All for what point? To the glory of the Father. Well, I've challenged myself. I hope I've challenged you just a little bit. What an awesome opportunity we have to make a difference in the world as we go out from this place. Jesus is Lord, and that changes everything. Let me pray for us. Yes, Jesus, this morning we acknowledge that you are Lord. You are God. We thank you that you came as a person. We thank you that you lived a life and that you died the death that you did. That by the breaking of your body and the shedding of your blood, we would have restored relationship with God. Opportunity into getting to know you and entering into eternal life. Father God, as we audaciously go out and boldly proclaim this countercultural truth that you are Lord and we absolutely believe that is true, would you help shape the lives in which we live? Would you open our eyes to the sins of omission where we are not doing what we should do? Would you open our eyes to our sins of commission, where we're doing what goes against the standard of your word. And Lord, would you start shaping us to look more like Jesus? And that as we boldly go and proclaim these things, people would come to glorify your name, even to the ends of the earth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you got the guest area, yeah? If you're visiting for the first time, why don't you come through? There's some really friendly people who would love to get to know you. And uh, if you're not new, hang around, Connect Cafe's outside, and we hope you have a good Sunday.